in today's good news. May we call on our attorney, attorney Cortez, for the preaching of the word. May the Holy Spirit be with you. Okay. So, good morning to one and all. And once again, this is a blessed opportunity to worship the Lord and to learn from His Word. Now, as I told you uh, last time, actually, this is a series of sermons on the second coming of Jesus Christ as expounded or taught in the uh, epistle to the Thessalonians. This epistle is known as uh, First Thessalonians, and we are now in chapter uh, 5. And Actually, I said last time that I intended to preach a sub-series no? on the topic secured for the second coming. And I thought it would only be a two-part series. Pero sangga pamalandong ko when I was, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, by the way, some of the people who are watching here are not uh, uh, Ilongos, no? they are uh, from Luzon. So instead of speaking in English and Ilonggo, I will be speaking in English and uh, Tagalog, no? So anyway, everyone can understand. Okay, uh, going back, I said we are studying the topic secured for the second coming. And instead of a two-part series, while I was meditating on our message for today, I found out that I could not limit myself to just two messages. So, our message for today is secured for the second coming, part 2A. Our text for this uh, morning is the First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 9 to 11. I might as well go to that uh, passage so that uh, you will know precisely what it is our, we are studying. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11 reads this way. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This is God's word. Let us first pray. Lord, we thank you once again for giving us the privilege of coming to you uh, in prayer and worship. Dear Lord, you are the source of our strength, the source of our life. Everything we have and are is a gift from you, and we are just uh, so thankful, O oh Lord, that you are so gracious and merciful to us, that you provide for all our needs, not only our material needs, but especially our spiritual needs. You have given us the gift of salvation, eternal life, wisdom in Christ Jesus, and love and joy in fellowship with one another. You are the source of all this. And you deserve all our praises, all our worship, and our prayer, O oh Lord, even as we study your word, is that you will speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to rely on human wisdom, but to rely on your wisdom, O oh Lord. The world might consider your wisdom foolishness, but your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It is only your wisdom, O oh Lord, that can truly build us up edify us and make us holy so that we can live lives that are pleasing to you and so that we can glorify you in every moment of our lives. We pray, O oh God, that indeed our worship to you today will be for your glory. Be glorified in our midst and please, O oh Lord, forgive all our sins. In and of ourselves we are not worthy, but thank you, O Lord, that you have covered us with the perfect righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ. We know, O Lord, that your blessing will be upon us because you are our loving Father and you have uh, promised to give us an inheritance, O Lord, which is truly excellent, magnificent, and beyond anything we can ever think or imagine. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. 
okay? What is it that we are studying this morning? We are studying about the grace of God which secures us for the second coming. If you remember, we learned that the second coming is a time of joy, celebration, and glory for those who are prepared, for God's children, for God's saints, for God's people. But it will be a time of disaster and destruction for those who are not prepared and who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and who are not God's people. And so, last time, we learned about the need to protect ourselves by wearing the armor of God. And one of the armor, uh, which is very important, is the helmet of the hope of salvation. That hope is a certain hope. Okay? It is an assured hope. But then, in verse 9, that was verse 8 actually of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But now in verse 9, going on to verse 10, we learn that ultimately, our security, our assurance that we will certainly reach the finish line, that we will certainly enjoy what is known as the final salvation, is because of God's power, God's initiative, God's power, God's sovereignty. And this is what really assures us because if our security depended on our own power only, then it will be a disaster because we are weak, we are puny, we are not consistent, we become unfaithful sometimes. So if everything, if, if everything depended on us in the final analysis, eh, kawawa naman tayo. We surely cannot reach the finish line. But God has promised, if you remember, no, he, he said, He who began a good work in you will finish it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this is the reason, because God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why last Sunday, we took time to meditate on God's appointment. Ultimately, our salvation is because God has destined us to obtain it. And if God decrees, destines, appoints, it cannot be thwarted. The will of God cannot be thwarted because He is the sovereign, omnipotent, almighty, all-powerful God. He has destined us and appointed us not for wrath, but to obtain salvation. But now, today, okay, and before I forget, I said this is about grace. And I told you last time, I hope you remember, that our understanding of grace is actually limited. Our understanding of grace actually is, uh, what is this, so far below what actually the scriptures reveal. Grace is so much greater than you think. It is so much greater than you can ever realize or imagine. And we learned that about God's appointment. I will not go back to that anymore because we have already studied that and I posted it already on YouTube. But now we are going to the next wonderful thing about grace. Not only is God's grace in His appointment wonderful and so much greater than we can ever imagine, the death of Christ, the atonement of Christ, the grace of God in the death of Christ is much more, is much greater than we can ever imagine. We thought we understood what the death of Christ is all about. All I can say is, as we study this passage, it is so much more than you ever realize. And I hope by God's Spirit, by God's grace, we will come to appreciate and understand how powerful, how effective the death of Jesus Christ for us really is so that we can all the more we can all the more exalt God and praise God for his much less and wonderful grace so going back for God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep we might live with him there are two things here which uh, should be noticed. Number one, we are secured by God's appointment. We have already learned that. 
God has destined us to obtain salvation, but now, today, our message is about we are secured by Christ's atonement. And the atonement of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, makes certain that we might live with Him. A while ago, or before, we learned that the appointment of God makes certain our obtaining salvation. Now, the death of Christ, the atonement of Christ, secures us because it makes certain our eternal life. It ensures that those whom God has appointed will obtain salvation and will live forever with Jesus Christ. Let me let us make some preliminary observations regarding the the passage. Actually, I am hesitating to speak in Tagalog because you might laugh, no? Uh, but uh, uh, let's see what happens. Okay, preliminary observ- observations regarding the passage. There are three things I'd like you to notice in this passage, okay? Number one, the connection between God's appointment and Christ's atonement. The two are inseparable, and I will explain to you the connection. The Bible says, God appointed us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean? This means the God who appointed the end or the goal also appointed the means. In other words, the fulfillment of God's appointment is not automatic. Okay? Now, I already explained this last time. Some people think that just because God destined or predestined or appointed something, it will automatically happen and all we have to do is just to sit back and relax. And I said, that is not how it works. Yes, the Bible teaches that God appoints us to obtain salvation. But He does so through means. In other words, means are necessary to implement God's appointment. We cannot just be passive. Okay? And in the case of our salvation, when it comes to our salvation, God has appointed us to obtain salvation, but He uses means. I will repeat that. He uses means. The appointment of God is not fulfilled automatically. It has to happen through the use of means and the primary means by which He implements that appointment, which that decision, that determination which He made in eternity past is through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the connection. I will try to explain in this message that there is a connection between God's appointment and Christ's aton- atonement. God's appointment is the determination, the plan which He decided beforehand, before the creation of the world. But the death of Jesus Christ is the implementation of that determination so that the result which God wants to accomplish will actually be accomplished. That's the connection. We go now to the next observation. The co-extension, and this is very simple. Now, please listen carefully. The Bible says, God appointed us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Okay. Please understand that the death of Jesus Christ was meant to accomplish the intention of the Father. The Son came down from heaven to die on the cross to do what? To implement, to fulfill God's plan. What was God's decision? What was God's determination? What was God's appointment? To obtain salvation for us. God appointed us to obtain salvation and Christ came down and atoned for our sins, died on the, on the cross to implement that decision which is salvation for us. Therefore, He died for us. There is a coextensiveness between God's appointment and Christ's atonement. God appointed us, therefore Christ died for us. The extent of the atonement is commensurate, proportionate, coextensive with the extent of God's appointment. I will explain that more in a little while. By the way, 
I know this is a bit technical and difficult. I would, as I said, I'm still hesitating to speak in Tagalog instead of Ilonggo. But anyway, this is being recorded. If there is anything difficult here, you can always watch it again on YouTube and go over it carefully. And I'm very thankful some people have told me that they have been listening again and again to my message last Sunday so that it will become more and more clear. So, so please bear with me. Let us be a little patient if uh, this is not, what is this, uh, as clear on the first hearing. And finally, the consequence. We have the connection, we have the coextension, and we have the consequence. So that whether we are asleep, awake or asleep, we might live with him. In other words, the death of Jesus Christ was meant to be effective. It was meant to implement the Father's will, the Father's appointment, so much so that those whom God appointed and gave to Jesus Christ will actually live. Let me put it in technical language. I will say it very carefully. The death of Jesus Christ was not hypothetical. It was actual. Christ did not hypothetically die for his people. He actually died for his people. What does that mean? It means Christ did not make salvation merely possible for his people. He ensured that salvation will be certain for his people because his death for his people is not hypothetical. It's actual. Otherwise, what will happen to the appointment of the Father? What is the point of the atonement if it is not, if it is not actual, if it does not actually obtain salvation for those whom he died for? That is why I'm, this is just introduction, but I'm taking a lot of time to establish the connection. The appointment and the atonement, they go together. The atonement was intended to fulfill the Father's plan. The Father's decision cannot be thwarted because He is the Father. Therefore, the death of Jesus Christ is effective. It's actual. It's not hypothetical. It does not merely make salvation possible for God's people. It makes it actual. It makes it certain. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That is already the conclusion. Just think about it at this time. Now, let me say this before I proceed. I, I just want to be honest with you. I was telling my wife yesterday, you know, I think I find it difficult to preach this message. And the difficulty is not so much in the complexity of the content of the message, the difficulty is in mastering the courage to faithfully teach God's Word. Because if this is what the Word of God really teaches, even if people find it unacceptable at first blush, it is still my duty as a preacher of God's Word to preach God's Word faithfully. And if this is what it says, this is what it says. That is the difficulty that confronts me. And I pray, and I hope you will pray with me, that as I continue teaching God's word, my only prayer is this, that I will preach the gospel simply, clearly, and faithfully. Okay? And it will take courage. But God has said, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Here is the overview of our message. Number one, we are going to learn about the necessity of the atonement. Why did Christ have to die? This is very important in order to understand why Christ's death is not only necessary, but it's effective. Because please take note, our goal is, our goal in this study is really to make it very clear to you that the death of Jesus Christ is effective. It effectively accomplishes the Father's will, the Father's appointment. It's not hypothetical. It's actual. 
it does not make salvation merely possible. It makes salvation certain for those who were appointed to obtain it. So, we'll come to that. Next, the intentionality of the atonement. The bulk of our message will focus on this. What did Christ intend to achieve by his death? This is the question. And right now, I will already answer the question. Then, in the coming minutes, in the time left to us, I will show the verses, support this thesis, this contention. What did Christ intend to achieve by his death? My answer is very simple. To actually save his people. Not merely to make salvation possible, that's merely hypothetical, but to actually save his people. That's the intention. Now we go to the support. Let me now present to you. Let's try to answer the first question. The necessity of the atonement. Why did Christ have to die? Okay, okay. So some of you might be wondering, why do we even have to deal with this question? Because there are some people who actually think, you might, you know, we're so familiar with this uh, concept that uh, Jesus Christ really needed to die. But do you not know that there are some people who are saying that, you know, why could not God simply forgive us? I mean, when we forgive others, do we have to die for them? We just tell them, I forgive you. It's as simple as that. But in the case of in the case of our salvation, why did Christ have to die? And the answer is because divine justice requires it. Here's what the Bible says. Luke 24, 25 to 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary? that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? The Bible is teaching us that the death of Christ is necessary. If ever we are to receive forgiveness of sins and to obtain salvation, Christ had to die. It's not enough for God to simply say, look, I simply forgive you. The words have fallen from my lips and that's it. No, it does not work that way. Why? Why did Christ have to die? And the answer is, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But again, the question is, why without the shedding of blood? Why does blood have to be shed in order for there to be forgiveness? And Romans 6.23 says, because the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our, our Lord. I do not want to go deeply into this because it will take so much time, but let me just mention, do you remember that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, when Eve partook or ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what was God's warning? On the day you eat of the fruit thereof, on that day you will die. Death is the penalty for sin. Death is the penalty for disobedience to the holy, omnipotent, sovereign, and great God. God is of such infinite majesty, of such infinite greatness, that the only appropriate penalty for anyone who disobeys Him is death. And in order to save us, this penalty must be paid. That is why, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But there's another problem. There's another problem. Who will pay the penalty? Because all of us are sinners. So, who has the capacity, the ability, the power to make sufficient payment for our sins? The penalty is death. I cannot die for you. You cannot die for my sins. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. So, who will do it? And again, the answer to that is, the necessity of the atonement, why did Christ have to die in particular? Why did Christ have to die? Why not anyone else? Why Christ? And the answer is, okay, the answer is, only a divine person can accomplish the task of paying for our sins. No one else. Okay. The Bible says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because 
He continues forever. He's immortal. Consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him since He always lives to make intercession for them. In the Old Testament, their method of forgiveness for the sins of the people was for the priest to offer sacrifices for the sake of the people. I will not go deeply into that. The problem is, the priest had to offer sacrifices again and again. And there was an end to it because the priest is mortal. The priest could die. But in the case of Jesus Christ, okay, He is the only one who can really offer the perfect sacrifice, really pay sufficiently for all our sins because He continues forever. But what does that mean? What does it mean when we say that Jesus Christ continues forever? He has the power of an indestructible life. And the answer is Revelation 22.13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, let me ask you this question. When you think about someone who is Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and the end, someone who continues forever, someone who is immortal, Who do you think about? And the only answer, the correct answer to that is, you think about God. And here now is the reason why it should be Christ and no one else who should die for our sins, who should pay the penalty, who alone can pay the penalty. It's Jesus Christ alone because He is God who continues forever. Please understand, my brothers and sisters, the death of sin is an infinite death. Do you not remember that the, punish, the punishment for our sins is everlasting punishment in hell? Who can pay that? Not even an angel can, can do that. But there is only one who has the power to match the infinite penalty of eternal punishment in hell. God himself. Because God has all the fullness of eternal life in himself as uh, immortal. As the sovereign, omnipotent, immortal God. In God, infinite payment was made to the infinite debt. And therefore, the debt was paid. I hope you understand that. Only God could make that payment. Only God. He alone is capable of making an infinite payment for an infinite debt. If your bill, if your indebtedness is worth a billions, a millionaire cannot pay for it even if he's a millionaire. You need a billionaire. But if the debt involves eternal punishment, then the payment that needs to be made has to come from someone who is capable of making an infinite payment. And the only one who can do that is God. But again, there's a problem. Again, there's a problem. The payment for sin is death. How could God die? Please think about that. God is the only one who can make the payment. Death is the penalty for sin. But how could God die? How could, even if he had the capacity and the power to make the payment, how could he make the payment when in the first place, He could not die. And here comes the unfathomable wisdom of God. This is where you will see that God God is really wiser, so much wiser than us. He was able to solve this unsolvable dilemma. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And here is what the Bible says. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's why Jesus Christ became man. When God became man, we call that the incarnation. This is the reason for the incarnation. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Because only God could make the payment, and because the payment involved death, and because God could not die, God became man, so that he could die and make payment for our sins. That is the answer to why God became man, and that is also the answer why it was Christ 
and Christ alone who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, you understand why is it that the atonement is necessary and why is it that Christ had to die on the cross? No one else because only Christ could make the payment. Okay, next. Here is the second question. We already answered the question, why did Christ have to die? But the next question is, what was God's intention in letting His Son die on the cross? What did Christ intend to achieve? Actually, I already answered this question, but I would just like to support it from the Scriptures. Let me, let me tell you the question again. Let me, say, let me ask you the question again. I, I want us to think deeply about this because it, you might think that this is theoretical. You might think that this is only, what is this, feeding the intellect. But no, if you really understand it, if you really understand the teaching of the Scriptures regarding the atonement of Christ, the result will be you will have a deeper appreciation for the power of grace and you will have a, a, a much greater gratitude to God for what He did for us. Because you know why? He did so much more than you ever realized. What did Christ intend to achieve when He died on the cross for us? There are three passages of Scripture through which we can learn the answer to this question. The first has to, okay, the first is prophecy, the Lord's teaching, and number three, the Lord's prayer. Okay, let's go to the first. What does prophecy say about the intention of God when He allowed or when He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins? Isaiah 53, verses 10 to 11. This is what the Bible says. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is the prophecy of Isaiah. This is Isaiah 53. It prophesies the death of the Messiah, the death of Jesus Christ. In this passage, you will learn about God's intention. What was really going on in the mind of God? What was His purpose in allowing His Son to die? Number one, it was the will of the Lord to crush Him. But what will be the result? What happens after God crushes His own Son? When His soul makes an offering for guilt, He shall see His offspring. In other words, there will be a positive result. The death of the Messiah will be effective. It will result in children. It's not hypothetical. It's actual and effective. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He shall see His offspring. He shall see them. They will be born. They will come to life. He shall prolong His days. That refers to His resurrection. The will of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. When God sent His Son to die for his people, the Lord gave him this command. My will will prosper in your hand. It, once again, your death will be effective. It will produce offspring. It will not be hypothetical. Forgive me for repeating and repeating, but I just want you to see what is in the word of what is in the word of God. The will of the Lord shall, what does it say? The will of the Lord shall prosper. In the Lord Jesus' hands, his death will be effective. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be, what? Satisfied. The Lord will be satisfied by his work on the cross. After he, he, he knows and he will see the results. My death will accomplish perfectly, completely the will of my Father. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. They will become righteous. They will be accounted righteous because I will see my offspring. The will of the Lord will prosper in my hand, says the Lord Jesus Christ. I will die and be satisfied because my offspring, they will really come to life. And wh why, why is he so sure about this? 
because I will bear their iniquities. I will bear their in- I will actually pay for their sins. It is not just that I will hypothetically pay for their sins and make ma- make forgiveness possible. No, I will make forgiveness certain for them. I will w- what do you mean by bear? What do you mean by payment? When, when you when you pay for something, is it a hypothetical payment or is it an actual payment? Did he really pay for our sins when he died on the cross? Did he or did he not? But if it was an actual payment, then he shall see his offspring. He shall be satisfied. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. I hope I am just faithfully preaching what is in the Word of God and I will leave it up to the Holy Spirit to enlighten you about this. Number two, we have just, what is this? Pondered on the prophecy of Isaiah. Let us now ponder on the teaching of our Lord in John chapter 6. Listen to this. What did Christ intend to achieve by his death? But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All of the... All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This happened, this teaching of our, of our Lord happened at a time when there were people who did, did not believe in Him. Now listen to the Word of God. Meditate on it. What does it say? But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. There were some people who do not believe. What is Jesus' response? All that the Father will come to me. What is the conclusion? You do not believe. You do not come to me. Because you were not given to me. If you were given to me, you will surely believe. And you will surely come. Because all. 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 All that the Father gives me will come to me. You did not come. You did not believe. Very simple. You are not part of the all. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me will never cast out. Now, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. What is that will? The will of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. Jesus Christ is merely implementing the prophecy of Isaiah. The will of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. I have come down from heaven to do the will of Him who sent me. It must prosper. It will prosper. What is that will? This is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me. But raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. And who are these people? Who are these people who will not be lost? Who are they whom He will raise on the last day? Who are they whom it is the Father's will should not be lost? Believers, believe those who believe in Jesus Christ. And who are they? You do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Who are they? Those whom the Father gave me. The ones who will believe because the Father gave them to His Son. That is the will of the Father. That is the will which Jesus Christ was tasked and charged to implement. I will lose none of those you gave me. And how will Christ do that? How will? That's now the question. That's the will of the Father. That is what He has to fulfill. That's His stewardship. That is His task. That is what He has to accomplish. That was what God entrusted to His Son. Make sure you lose none of them. That's my will. Make sure it prospers. Who are they? The ones who were believers. The ones who were given by the Father to the Son. And what must Christ do? What must Christ do to make sure that this happens? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life 
for the sheep. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will, they will, they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. They will live with him forever. For God destined us not for us, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live with him forever. One flock, one shepherd, together forever. This charge I have received from my father. This is my father's will. My father's determination. This is the plan of my father. My father's decision. This is what I was charged to implement. This is my task to make sure that none of them are lost. And how shall I do it? How shall I do it? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 25-30 Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The words that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. And here is what the Bible says. Accept it or not. This is very clear. What does it say? But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Let that sink in. My sheep hear my voice. They will hear. And I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the security I am talking about that the Bible is teaching. God appointed. Christ atoned. They are secure. Christ laid down his life for the sheep. And because of that, the sheep have eternal life. And they will never perish. The death of Christ, the grace of God in the death of Christ is more powerful than you ever realized. It does not only make salvation possible, it makes salvation certain. And finally, finally, let us go to the Lord's Prayer. What is the intention of God when He allowed His Son when he sent his son to die on the cross, what did Christ intend to achieve by his death on the cross? Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. The, the task. The will of the Lord will prosper in His hand. I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and that they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours. He does not pray for the world but he prays for those who were given to him. Why? Back to Isaiah 53. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for transgressors. He is merely implementing the prophecy of Isaiah. He is interceding for those whose sins he bore. The sins of many. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I pray not for the world, but I pray for them. Those whom you have given me. Holy Father, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one. One flock, one shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep, so that there may be one flock, one shepherd, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. Not one of them has been lost. Except the son of destruction that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But the ones who were given to him, not one of them will be lost. I lay down my life for my sheep. They shall never perish. 
that one of them will be lost. This is the charge I have received from my father. I do not ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I have other sheep. They must come and be one, then one flock, one sheepfold, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Next. Verses 22 to 24 of John 17. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. Watch this, watch this. I will come back to that. And love them even as you loved me. God the Father not only loves the Son, He loved those whom He has given to His Son. Us believers, He also loves us. But the question now is, in what way does He love us? He loves us in the same way that He loved His Son. Now, just suspend that in your uh, minds at this time. Father, I desire that they also whom that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. God destined us to obtain salvation through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who died for us so that we may live with him forever, that they may be where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. How did God love, love his son? He loved him before the foundation of the world. How does God love us? He loved us in the same way that He loved His Son. Therefore, what's the conclusion? If He loved His Son before the creation of the world, and He loved us in the same way that He loved His Son, therefore, He loved us before the foundation of the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. I offer myself as a sacrifice. For their sake, I died on the cross that they may be sanctified, that they may be made holy. And now to wrap things up, here's the conclusion. Remember this passage because we will go back to Ephesians 1 and I will show you the connection between the atonement and the appointment. Okay? Christ laid down his life for his sheep. Because the Father loved them in the same way that He loved the Son. The Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. And the Father loved us, whom He has given to Christ, believers, before the foundation of the world. And here's the conclusion. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. I consecrate myself. I die on the cross. I give up my life so that they will be sanctified in the truth, made holy and blameless. It's the same thing. In love. Oh, there's the love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. He predestined us to become His children. What motivated Him? Love. He loved the Son before the foundation of the world. He loved us in Christ before the foundation. Is it not becoming clearer now? Is not everything now becoming coherent? Do you not see that everything now is being connected? It's there all along. We just need the eyes to see it. According to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved, in Him. And now here's the death of Christ. You were reading Ephesians 1 all along and you missed the cross. But it was there all along. The death of Jesus Christ was there all along. Predestination, adoption, election, now redemption, the death of Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. To unite all things in heaven and things on earth. To make them one so that we will be with Him forever. Back to 1 Thessalonians 5. 9 to 11. For God did not destine us for us, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, huh? who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him forever. One with the Father and the Son. One shepherd. One flock. United heaven and earth. 
one because Christ laid down his life for the sheep for those whom the Father gave him so that the will of the Lord might prosper in his hand. We say Christ so died that he infallibly secured the salvation of a multitude that no man can number who through Christ's death not only may be saved but are saved, must be saved and cannot by any possibility run the hazard of being anything but saved. The sheep will be saved. I lay down my life for the sheep so that they may be one with me and my father and so that they will never perish. This charge I have received from my father, take home. Christ died to make salvation not merely possible but certain for all those whom God appointed to obtain salvation. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. It will be effective. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper. It shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Not one drop of our blessed Lord will be wasted. It will accomplish all that God had destined and determined. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. That is the atonement of Jesus Christ. It is a perfect, complete, successful, effective implementation of the Father's will. God appointed, Christ atoned, we shall live forever with Him. That is the security we have, not only in the appointment of the Father, but in the atonement of the Son. Praise be to God for His glorious grace. Let us pray. Dear Father, I know that there was a lot of solid food that we had to partake of this morning. There is so much that is beyond us. But thank you, O Lord, that it is in your word. And you said, Your word is a two-edged sword, sharp enough to divide the joints and the marrow. Lord, we pray that the message this morning will just open our eyes to see our much less grace. It is so much greater than we ever imagined. We thought you only made salvation possible for us. But no, O Lord, In your sovereign grace, in your infinite love, you made salvation not merely possible but certain for those whom you have given to your Son. Thank you, O Lord, that because of your power and your grace, the death of Christ was effective. It actually paid for our sins. It did not merely make salvation hypothetical. It was an actual ransom. And because of that, O Lord, we are secure. All because of your grace. This is your grace, O Lord, greater than we can ever imagine. For your thoughts are higher than than our thoughts. Your wisdom is so much higher than our mere, puny, foolish human wisdom. May you be glorified, O Lord. May your grace be continued to exalted. Amen. And may your word and your will prosper just as you have determined. Your word will not return to you void. It will accomplish what you please. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.